Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here, for those joining us in person, and I know that we have um, quite a few people online joining us as well, so very grateful that you all are here. My name is Shakela Alvarenga, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mob Museum, and again, thank you for being here tonight. And we also want to thank the Black Student Law Association at UNLV for their outreach assistance with tonight's program as well. So as many of you know, February is Black History Month, a time to highlight and celebrate the achievements of African Americans. And after a tumultuous year which tested the nation's strength and courage, we are honored to present this program to you tonight. Our panelists are leaders of the Las Vegas community and they are the trailblazers of our time. Joining us on video conference is Laverne Ligon. Ligon was a former dance captain of MGM Grand's Hallelujah Hollywood, which was the Las Vegas Strip's first all-black line of showgirls. After retiring in 1982, Ligon opened the Simba Talent Agency, a dance school for at-risk youth. Brenda Williams is the president of the Westside School Alumni Foundation. She was the first African American to work in a bank in a non-service capacity in the state of Nevada. Williams has the distinction of being the first black female member appointed to the Las Vegas City Council and the Las Vegas Planning Commission. And with the help of the Westside School Alumni Foundation Board of Directors, Williams also offers educational scholarships to the underserved youth of our community. Clay T. White is the inaugural director of the Oral History Research Center at UNLV. She chronicles the history of the Las Vegas black community. She is one of the five founders of the Las Vegas Black Historical Society. White is also a member of the Mob Museum's Advisory Council. And David Washington was the first black fire chief in Las Vegas and under his leadership, the department increased its overall staffing and reduced response times. He also helped to establish the Las Vegas Fire and Rescue Foundation. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Please give our panelists a warm welcome. Let's start to applaud myself. <laughs> so, it was a short but vibrant life. The Moulin Rouge Hotel on the west side opened its doors in 1955. It was the first fully integrated hotel in Las Vegas, and it's also a pivotal landmark of black history. So let's start here. Clay T, let's talk about the significance of the Moulin Rouge. Why was the Moulin Rouge so impactful for the black community? When you think of a hotel casino and uh, a place as plush as the dunes, the sands, Desert Inn, that's what was built in the black community. The black community really started at H, uh, ended at H Street at the time. So this casino was built just beyond the boundaries. So we are talking about just a few feet from the boundary. So you have in your community now a place that rivals anything on the strip or downtown. The sign was designed by Betty Willis. So we don't have that many signs left. <laughs> she was also the one who designed the Welcome to Las Vegas sign. So a very, very famous sign maker. It was the first line of black dancers in Las Vegas. So we have a person on the panel tonight that was on the first line of black dancers on the Las Vegas Strip, but this line was the first in the city of its kind. The location was also the place where the meeting was held on March 26, 1960, that integrated the city of Las Vegas. So those are some of the reasons that it's so significant. Right, mm -hmm. and it's also important to understand the role really that the Mulan played on the west side of Las Vegas and Brenda Williams will bring you in here. Not only was the Mulan Rouge 
a symbol of Las Vegas' civil rights struggle, but it also was a source of pride for many people who lived there. Can you share some of your thoughts as well? well thank you for the question. Uh, I actually believe that the source of pride perhaps would have been more so with the individuals in the community who helped construct the Moulin Rouge. They were the construction workers, the hard carriers, the bricklayers, and those types of people. Because the Moulin Rouge, the head people, did not recruit individuals to work at the Moulin Rouge from the neighborhood, not from the community. They reached out to other communities like the Los Angeles, San Francisco, and those types of people uh, to bring in their expertise. But on the other hand, I think if we start talking about pride, uh, some of our more prominent civil rights leaders relocated to Las Vegas during that time and positioned themselves to assist others who in the ongoing struggle of civil rights for Las Vegas. Uh, the targeted hotel casinos created a more welcoming atmosphere for those who otherwise would never have come under the Iron Curtain, that's the West uh, Bonanza underpass, okay? Uh, <laughs> uh, so they would never come over to visit uh, an established uh, casino on the West Side. So the West Side benefited not only from the influx of new patrons to their establishments, but also their money. Mm -hmm. The Moulin Rouge, it paved the way, as we mentioned, for opportunities on the Las Vegas Strip, especially in the entertainment field. For example, MGM's Hallelujah Hollywood show. Now, this photo, look at that right there. Laverne <laughs> Ligon, yeah. this was taken in the early 1970s. Laverne, let's bring you in here. Tell us a little bit about your career leading up to this point. I can't hear you too well. It was a can, little. Can you hear me, Laverne? I can hear you now. Okay, so I, I, we're showing a photo of you from the <laughs> 1970s. It's a beautiful, a, a beautiful photo. Um, tell us a little bit just about your career leading up to, to that point. Well, needless to say, that was many years ago, and I wish <laughs> I was like that today. But. Um, I came to uh, Las Vegas after auditioning for Hallelujah Hollywood in um, 1973. And um, that's where we had our first rehearsal at the MGM, the first MGM now known as Ballets. And um, we rehearsed for many months. The show opened in 1974. And this was like nothing I had ever experienced before to see a building this huge. It, at this particular time, it was the largest stage in the nation, as far as I know. And uh, it, it we danced with sawdust on the floor, had to wear hard hats because it was still uh, pretty risky. And at times we had to sit because there was nowhere for us to rehearse. And uh, we, we became a, a big family. But the difference um, in this show was um, that we had a, a line of color, females, six ladies and two extras. So eight female dancers all together. And true, we were in the show with other non-blacks, but we danced with our own line. We had our own costumes. And I think Don Arden, who was the producer director of Hallelujah Hollywood, had this vision, but I think he did it at this time. It was tasteful, tastefully done. And we pre were presented 
it's like a specialty act. We didn't feel like we were being segregated. And I loved it because we made more money. <laughs> we <laughs> made right. more costumes. And uh, eventually other members in the cast, females, wanted to be in our line. And they would go out and get a deep suntan to prove <laughs> that they were um, the color as much as we were. <laughs> Eventually, after a few years, the line did become integrated. Uh, there was a lady who was from New York, a New York dancer. She was Jewish, and she honestly tanned darker than I was. Mm. Yeah. And um, it, it was just a, a great experience. Um, I, I eventually became the dance captain and I ended up and stayed there for eight, eight and a half years. Mm. And eventually when the, after the show closed, uh, another spectacular was um, opened Jubilee. And I was also the dance captain mm -hmm. in that awesome. uh, particular show also. I didn't last as long. I had an, an accident, a fall on stage and I injured my knee and mm -hmm. my career was over in one day. Wow. But I did continue for a while um, breaking in new dancers and teaching the choreography. Mm. So I stayed as long as I could until that became illegal. Because <laughs> they felt I was <laughs> in danger. And Laverne, I'm curious to know, you know, after your accident, what happened there? What did you do? Uh, well, while I was uh, doing the show, um, I, I used to teach technique classes or bar, bar class behind stage to just kind of keep some of the girls up with their ballet technique. I mean, MGM was not a show where you could just go in because you were uh, long leg and pretty and mm -hmm. you had to have dance, a good dance technique mm -hmm. as the basis of, of your talent. And, um, so after I had my accident, it was suggested to me, well, why don't you just open up a dance, a dance school? So I did. I opened up Simba Town Development Center. Mm -hmm. And the main reason was because while I was dance captain, as, as um, the dancers would leave, I would have difficulty replacing the spots with more um, ladies of color. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't make sense. You know, I was calling in New York, DC, California, and it was just very difficult. And it, it just seemed good reason that I should train uh, the kids that we had in Las Vegas to prepare them um, for this career opportunity since the doors had opened up to us. And that, that's how we got started. And um, in the show uh, was Winston Hemsley, who was a, a dancer from New York. And we had, we had danced together in New York in Hello Dolly with Pearl Bailey and Cat Calloway. And Little did I know I would meet him again in Las Vegas. And he and his partner were a specialty act. Then when Hallelujah uh, Jubilee opened, he was one of the main three choreographers. And um, so he came with me, he and I put our heads together and we started Simba Talent Development Center. And the problem was, <laughs> they said, Laverne, 
you'd leave the front desk. They said, I gave away everything. <laughs> <laughs> My mother was there. Um, uh, and David Washington was on our board, and eventually he became the president of Simpertown Development Center. You always and get I, suckered into stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a lot of stories here. We won't get into that. But I taught his daughter, um, Amber. She, she was a very good dancer, too. And I, I know that she's still um, out there doing it with the church and I know she teaches her her daughters mm -hmm. and I'm really very proud of her and you know and and she's a beautiful person with a beautiful family and I'm just happy that I was able to contribute a little bit to that. <laughs> yes. Laverne, thank you, thank you. David. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, certainly not only Amber, but also Angel. Angel didn't stay very long, but Amber, she, yes. she, she, she continues today with her church dancing. And one thing about, you know, when, when children are going, because we have, we have four children, three girls and a boy, only thing we ask them to go to school, get good grades, and move about your business. Well, they got <laughs> mad. She, Amber in particular got mad with us because we wouldn't make her stay and dance. And Laverne today, she still tries to get back it ain't coming back, Amber. You're 40 years old. <laughs> you, you, will, you will never get back in that kind of shape again it in life, so is. forget about it. But yeah, she, was, uh, she got angry at Marsha and I because she thought we should have pushed her to stay and dance. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> I'm still trying, I'm still trying to get back in firefighter shape. And the six-pack, Marsha said, you ain't got no six-pack. You got a, a keg down there. <laughs> But yeah, uh, uh, that was a great school, and, and, and again, a lot of young people came out of there. That a few went on to become professional dancers. Others just, just the discipline that you get from it is, is great for, for children That's or young true. people. That's true. Absolutely. And another pioneer of our time, David Washington, the first African-American fire chief here in Las Vegas. And David, let me uh, share this photo with everyone. It's of... Monroe Williams and James Walker, the oh, first yeah. two black firefighters hired by the city. Tell me a little bit about the story behind it. Well, it was the NAACP that raised a lot of cane with the city when they saw that there weren't a lot of black police officers, uh, firefighters. In fact, um, Lieutenant Jackson, who went in 1958, actually he could have been the first firefighter because he was a firefighter at Nellis. And the police officer, this according to Lieutenant Jackson, who retired from Metro, they paid $10 more to be a, a police officer. They say, I'm gone. So when Monroe and James came on in 63, and again, a lot of times when I'm speaking, I always bring their names up, and some, get, some folks get angry. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Had it not been for those two guys taking the hill that they took to include, as I told the, the reporter from Channel 3, when they would eat, they'd take their plates and throw them in the trash can to try to humiliate them so they would leave the job. Well, Monroe stayed around for 25 and a half years and retired as a fire captain. James Walker said, the hell with this, I'm out of here. He went into the gaming industry and, mm -hmm. and had a successful career there. But uh, on the whole, I am grateful to God and, and thank you for the opportunity. And, and Clayton, thanks for suggesting me to be a part of this. I feel like I'm, I don't know where I am with all this stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> the new norm. But look, and, um, in 1979, a group of black firefighters got together, and it didn't quite work, work out. We were meeting at one of, the, one of my other mentors, because Monroe was a, and Larry Powell, who retired as assistant chief, fire chief, they were my mentors. When they retired, Rex Shelburne, John Ryan, two white guys, they were not my mentors. They would have mentored me had I asked, but I viewed them more as role models. I watched what they did, the good I'd taken, applied to my own career, and, and what they were doing that I thought was bad, I, I didn't deal with that. But we filed a complaint against the city in the early, in the early 80s, and all we wanted was a, a level playing field. Some guys, of course, will, yeah, let's, let's, let's make, them, make all of us captains. No, we can't do that. Everybody's not captain material. This is too dangerous of a job for us to just go in there and say, make us all officers. And out of that, 
unlike the county who went to federal court and it spent, they spent 10 years fighting with the county before they won some significant money for two or three of those guys. We didn't get a lot of money, but what we, what we did get was a level playing field. For example, if I go before an oral board, this way you do your, you do your written test, you do your oral presentation before a panel generally of three people. If I go in and the panel is three white guys, more times than not, I'm not gonna make it. So we said we want, we said we want a black on the board. They never would, and I still got the agreement that we signed, it was called a EOC uh, uh, settlement agreement. They would only allow a minority, and they violated that. So I'm, slammed, I'm slamming yeah. them in the RJ, and I know the RJ is out there, and, and Mayor, Mayor Bill Breer called me to his office, Captain Washington, why are you beating us up in the press? I took out my little agreement. I said, sir, with all due respect, I'm just like you. I was elected to a position by a small body of people. Of course, my scope is not as large as yours, but look, is that your signature there? He said, yeah. I said, I know what happened, sir. They came in here and they briefed you. We had about 14, 14 15 different things that we, think, we felt we were being violated in terms of discrimination and our rights as employees. And one had to do with particularly us and, the, and those oral boards. So he said, I got you. He took care of it. We never had an issue with that again. But the sad part is today, now if, you, if you don't mind me telling you a little bit about today. In 1995, you guys, blacks made up 15% of all paid professional jobs in American fire service. Today, going forward, in 2012, we were at 8%. Now, here we are in 20, 20, 2021. I don't have these numbers, but those original numbers come from Department of Labor, census tract information, and there's a group of attorneys, black and whites, who are helping to fight the discrimination and, and uh, systemic racism that exists within the fire service today. I'm also, on a national level, I work with a group called IFC, the International Association of Fire Chiefs, BCOC, the Black Chief Officers, IABPFF, the International Association of Black Professional Firefighters. I am the president and CEO of a group called the Carl Holmes Executive Development Institute. It's a training institute to help to prepare blacks in particular to move up through the ranks in the fire service. That's, how, that's one of the reasons I became fire chief by attending that program. Now, in, in recent years, and this is a 29-year-old program getting ready to be 30 years, we allow anybody who want to come. We, we, we don't discriminate. We have whites there now. We have women, Asians, you name it, they come because out of this San Francisco, St. Louis, we have, I can tell you a number of fire chiefs to include women, black and white, who, who became fire chiefs as a result of coming through the Carl Holmes Executive Development Institute. So this is a little bit, yeah, yeah, you know. And it's, in this day and age, you guys, there, there's no reason for us to be hating on each other for any particular reason. I don't care if you're gay, straight, all of that madness that we, that we find reasons as fellow human beings to, to be a, against one another. It, it just makes no sense to me. I have no time for hate. There's some people I don't like. I ain't gonna never like them. But, that, but I don't hate them because as I told the, the reporter from, from Channel 3, this Gabby, I say, hate, it takes your energy away. You ain't got time for that. And I remember you from Channel 8. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I can go on and on. I can talk. I'm like Brenda Williams. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Thank you, David. Sure. And I appreciate the story say? of um, Mr. Monroe Williams because it wasn't until recently that I realized that Monroe <laughs> Williams is Brenda Williams' is late husband. Oh, yes. really? And you were both recognized at Legacy Park, right? I believe. Yes, probably. Yes. <laughs> You're like, I don't know anymore. Okay. Just, hello. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about, about your late husband, Monroe. Oh, Monroe was an excellent individual. He was very, very smart. Uh, he was in the U.S. Navy, and he was a corpsman. So uh, when he uh, got out of the Navy, he uh, actually started attending UNLV because he wanted to be a... Uh, I forgot, like physical therapist, okay. And subsequently, James Walker said to him, you know, hey, they're hiring blacks at the fire department. Come on and go down. And I know you can pass the test. He's a very intelligent man. And, and we'll do this together. So they did. And Monroe actually wound up being the first professional uh, medic 
that they actually had for the city of Las Vegas Fire Department. He was actually the first one that actually knew what to do when the rescue wagon ran. He was in charge of rescue. Um, Monroe trained a lot of his superiors. Uh, he, he was great with numbers. He was great with a lot of things, highly intelligent. As a matter of fact, at his funeral, his captain uh, at, at the time said that he would not be a captain had it not been for Monroe teaching him hydraulics and all of those things that were necessary to pass the exam. So he said, I would not be standing here today were it not the shoulders of Monroe Williams. So uh, he had a great amount of character. He was uh, always um, actually involved in the community from way back when uh, Operation Independence run by Miss Libertha Johnson mm -hmm. later became uh, Economic Opportunity Board. Monroe was appointed to that board by Grant Sawyer, who was the governor at that time. So we were highly political because we understood that we could not grow as a people unless we had political influence. And I dare say there are not too many white people who were elected to office, and if they're around, they'll tell you today, were it not for the people on the west side. And Monroe was just an integral part of the West Side. He loved his community. He wanted to see uh, a difference in the community. As a result, it just kind of rubbed off on me, too. We, we wanted to do the right thing. Yes. Thank you, Brenda. And we'll talk about the West Side in, in just a little bit. I want to share uh, one more photo. In 2001, um, Mr. Washington was appointed Las Vegas oh, Fire Chief. Mom. This is a photo of him and... <laughs> Uh, former mayor, Oscar Goodman, and we talked previously about your push for, for racial diversity. Uh, interested to hear how successful that was. I, I can imagine it was a, a difficult road as you've been talking about. Let me tell you something. I've, I've been to federal court twice. One the first time, the second time we got our clock clean. My wife was with me every day and she was steady nudging me. And in the federal court, if any of you guys haven't been there, it's very clinical, because I'm ready to raise some hell up in there, because I know some people stand, sitting up there lying, and my attorney said, see the mics down there? Okay. <coughs> but my, my point to that is, you know, I was called a bigot or racist, and I, I want to give you these stats, and y'all can go ch fact check this. When I was doing my tenure as fire chief, I promoted over 180-some people. 74% of them were white. 15% was black, 11% was others. Now you can go down there and check personnel. So my point is, I'm not gonna sit there as a black man and not promote anybody black. But there are some black guys, they hate me to this day. Can I say, pull, can't pull puss out a boot? Well, I just said it. They, could, they, could, they, couldn't, they couldn't hit their butt with both hands, but they want me to promote them because I'm black. Are you serious? Oh. I don't do that. Yeah. I have some integrity about myself, and plus, I don't want to embarrass my family, my community, by going up there doing something stupid, promoting somebody who cannot handle the job. When, you, when I took over, because I used to be a PIO way back in my career, so me and, which I know you know from your work, Tim Szymanski, me and Tim put on a class to teach all of our officer level personnel how to deal with the press, because you know y'all can do different things that throw people off. <laughs> so anyway, this guy would never deal with the press. I'm like, are you serious? And then you, you want me to promote you to the next level? Mm. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. The other thing is, when, like Monroe being a fire captain, when you, when you get, roll up on a scene, you do what they call take command. Now I'm listening to it because I have to monitor the radio as a, when I became a deputy chief. The fire chief, I was a fire marshal. We have to monitor the radio even if we don't go on scene. This guy would always do what they call pass command. No, you on, you on scene, man. You're supposed, you, we pay you to take charge. So when I, told, when I told him those two things, his eyes got big as silver dollars. That's why I didn't promote Well, you're not going to ever promote me. I didn't say that, but you ain't ready right now. When you get ready, come back. So there's things that you have to do when you're at this level 
of quote unquote success, white folks will get mad with me, black folks will get mad at me if I hire somebody that ain't got sense enough to do the job. And they should. They should want to beat my butt for hiring somebody that can't handle a job. So I always try to make sure that I hired people that could do the job. And another quick story, I started out doing what's called round tables, even though I came in there with street language, cussing and fussing, and my boss called me in and he beat me up pretty good. So you ain't supposed to, we expect you to operate up here. But my point to that, one day we were, we were at, a, at, a, at one of our fire stations doing what we call the round tables. And, and at the time, I think I might have promoted like 20 some officers. And, and one, of the, one of my white officers said, well, we think that you're just scraping the bottom. bottom. What, what do you mean? Well, you're hiring people that's on the lower part of the list. Uh. Yeah. The list was about to exhaust. But I still had the opportunity to promote more people. So, I, yeah, I promoted them. They met all the criteria. So this is my question that I learned from Monroe. I said, did I promote anybody who couldn't read or write? Did I promote anybody who got to a fire scene and froze up? There was, there was a couple of white officers. They get to the fire. They're so afraid of fire, they just sit there, petrified, mm -hmm. petrified. And the guy said, uh, no, you didn't. I said, well, OK. So my point was, don't try to, and I always tell people, whatever job you're in, whatever profession, know something about the history of that profession. Mm -hmm. Because when they come at you with garbage, you throw stuff back, and I shut them all down. And I said, I ain't going to call no names, because it might be related to one of y'all. <laughs> Get beat up. <laughs> I'm hard. Did they talk I about can't it? help. Clay Dave. Dave, thank you so sure. much. And, um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the West Side because of mm -hmm. just the, how much history that, mm -hmm. that neighborhood holds. Laverne, I'm interested. I know you worked a lot on the Strip, but do you remember the West Side? What was your experience there as well? Well, when, when I moved to uh, Las Vegas, I didn't know anything about the West Side. But um, in our line, we it was a member who was from the West Side. Her name was Pamela Noble. And she turned out to be a really beautiful dancer. And she would more or less give me some insight because when I came, I said, well, where, where did the Black people live? When I moved to Vegas, I lived not too far. Uh, I lived behind the um, MGM, it's like near paradise. Um, and, and so her, her dad uh, lived on the west side and sometimes she would take me to her house and I met him. And I, I slowly started to uh, meet people, but basically dancing the MGM and the, the members in the cast was my world, and I didn't spread out for a while. But, and I said, I, I'm not gonna stay here in Vegas, it's too slow, it wasn't enough <laughs> culture for me, and I don't know, it just hit me one day that I think Vegas needs me to help this part of, of its development. Mm -hmm. And um, so here comes Simba. That's when I started Simba Talent Development Center. And the, my students were pulled from the, this at-risk community. And they were exposed to the, the cultural arts, especially dance. And we had people, uh, professionals who were Friends of ours, Winston and Rich Rizzo, uh, they came in like Ben Vereen, Michael, Michael Peters, um, Gregory Hines would come in and we had fundraisers and uh, because David, am I right? Simba was having a hard time financially because we did not have that many paying uh, students. When we first opened, most of our clientele was 
white. And the black community was very skeptical of what we had to offer. So, you know, they just sat back and watched us. And then when Simba developed a, a, a junior company and we started doing dance lecture demonstrations throughout the community and we took a little troop through and uh, exposed them to the development of dance from the African uh, rhythms to classical ballet, tap, jazz. And uh, we received a lot of credit for educating the community. And eventually we started seeing uh, our people come through the door. The problem was they didn't have the funds to pay for the classes. And that's when I got in trouble and they took me off the front desk. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we had uh, lots of fundraisers, so we had many scholarship students. Thank you, Laverne. Yes. <laughs> Brenda Williams, you've done tremendous work and we briefly talked about it, but on the West Side, and I know it's a place that is, is dear to your heart, a predominantly African-American neighborhoods and you wrote this book, West Side School, Alumni Stories, Our School, Our Community, Our Time. Why do you think it was important to tell these kinds of stories? And tell me about maybe your favorite one. Well, favorite, they're all awesome and compelling, so I wouldn't dare try to select a favorite. That's a comp the book is a compilation of stories as told by individuals uh, who attended the historic West Side School, the oldest standing school in Las Vegas. It was built in 1923, and it closed in 1967. The need to tell the stories was born out of the fact that our history was being omitted, and those who thought they knew it were not really telling the stories because they didn't. And so I said, well, wait a minute. I know enough people in this town who grew up with my aunts and uncle, they are still alive and yet they can tell their own stories. So that's how the book got started. And we formed the West Side School Alumni Foundation in order to support the renovation and, and, uh, of the West Side School so that we could leave a legacy for the children and the people who came after us. So in that book, we have like the oldest author, and I call them all authors because they either wrote or told us their stories. The oldest living teacher from West Side School is Miss Audrey James. She is 106 years old. Mm -hmm. She has all of her faculties about her. She just called me the other day and she wants me to do some things for her because she doesn't like the uh, amount of time that the Supreme Court justices should sit on the Supreme Court. It should be limited, she said. Mm -hmm. And she's writing it up and she and I will get this on to the right people. But it's people of, of that quality that lived on the West Side. You, with, if, have we not written the book? These are people whose stories would never have been told. Nobody understood that um, uh, how many judges, federal court judges, district court judges, uh, attorneys, pediatricians, architects, all of those people went to West Side School and they left that legacy seat. So it was important to tell the story so that the kids that came after us could understand that they stand on the, the shoulders of greatness. I often hear, used to hear Dave say all the time, you know, I, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have to give honor to those whose shoulders we stand on. And that's absolutely true. I, I was listening last night to, uh, I, I believe it was, uh, it was PBS, and it was about uh, blacks in, uh, well, what am I saying? the black churches, right? And the first black minister from uh, AME, female, said I, uh, they did 
and I am, because she's recognizing that she stood on the shoulders of greatness, and, and it was quite something, because that's the way I felt. And, and to just explain a little bit uh, about uh, the importance of the book, in 2012, um, the Las Vegas Centennial Commission uh, gave uh, the West Side School uh, Alumni Foundation a certificate. We, we won the 2013 uh, Historic Award of the Year, okay? And uh, it, 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 I know so much about it, I, I'm trying to be succinct so Dave doesn't accuse me of talking as much <laughs> as he does. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but at any rate, the book is well read. Uh, our first, um, the inauguration for the, ball, the book, hmm. we did a launch party at Nevada Partners. We invited, uh, over 250 people who had actually attended West Side School, those who had, had helped write the book, and uh, we made enough money to show up at UNLV with over $10,000 in scholarships that we were going to give to the upward bound students. Those were the underserved students in the community. I recently had an opportunity to interact um, with um, uh, Dr. Kevin Wright, who is an assistant director of diversity and, and uh, social justice at UNLV. And I asked him, I said, would you do me a favor and write some comments for me to share with our board of directors? And he said, you want me to write a comment? Do you want me to write a review? I said, your choice, whatever you have time to do. So the other day he sent me this, and if you'll allow me, I will like to read that. Uh, Dr. Wright says, this is not just a book. It is a culmination to honor and sustain the legacy of, black, of the black community in Las Vegas. It artistically articulates the history of the West Side in a manner that balances the hardship and struggles with the success and joy that has come from the community. Definitely a must read masterpiece. I was moved to tears because he added value to our book. Needless to say, I didn't know that Kevin grew up on the West Side. It, is, is that not interesting? It, it's how things uh, go in full circle. But the book demonstrates uh, the contributions that students from the West Side and from the West Side School made to the development and growth of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Brenda Williams, the first black banker in Las Vegas as well. What was that experience <laughs> like? Horrific. <laughs> 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 it, it, it was, it really was. Uh, just as an example, and, and I'm sure you all probably saw the front page of the Las Vegas Sun not too long ago, on my first day at work, uh, my supervisor told me that, um, you know, we have to work, uh, work with you, but we don't have to like it. He said, mm -hmm. and we don't have to like you. So now can you imagine starting your first day of work under that kind of stress? But I was bound and determined to stay on that job. There's an awful lot of uh, uh, resilience that you have to have in order to be the first, particularly in a racist situation. But you know, I made it through there because my family was proud of me, my mother and father were proud of me, my husband was proud of me, and one day I looked out in the lobby and this white lady was standing watching me and I thought, Oh, that's Miss French. That's the principal at West Side School. She was my kindergarten teacher. Hmm. So she was ass assessing the situation. She waited till just about everybody had gone. And she walked over and she looked at the top of the counter at my nameplate. And she said, no, Brenda Joyce Smith is your name. 
And I said, wow, that was impressed. And I said, yes, Mrs. French. She said, I knew you were going to be somebody. That made me feel so good. Mm -hmm. That was the nicest thing a white person had ever said <laughs> to me. <laughs> so <laughs> endurance, yes. I had <laughs> endurance. But you know, uh, again, uh, there, there had to be uh, a political element involved in me getting the job. I just wasn't aware of it. When I went in the bank to get a, I, did, I didn't go there to get a job. I took my last unemployment insurance check, and I had a car payment that I needed to make. And I was on my way out, and I saw personnel on the wall going upstairs, spiffing gas, and um, <laughs> First National Bank of Nevada. And I went up and says, "Well, this personnel, so you guys have jobs?" And I go, "Yeah." So it's, well, I wanted to apply for a job. They said, what, what are you offering? So long story short, they told me, and it was almost like they were trying to intimidate me. Well, uh, what can you do? What do you guys do? Uh, that, that was, I'm, I'm arrogant too, so. <laughs> uh, I, I simply, she says, well, you'll just have to take a test. And I said, okay, that's fine. When, do you, when can you take the test? Can you give it to me now? And they were shocked about that. I said, yeah. So they're fumbling around, doing all this stuff. And finally, they gave me the test. I was done with the test in 20 minutes, because it was, to me, it was simple. And then after that, they said, oh, wow, you passed. <laughs> OK. Then she mm -hmm. says, uh, do you know Bob Bailey? I said, yep, I know Bob Bailey. Uh, do you know uh, Dr. McMillan? I do know Dr. McMillan. And so that's when I realized whose shoulders I was standing on. Somebody had prepared the way. I wasn't aware of it, but I had gone to the bank for that. And I didn't stay there because it, it was a hostile working environment. If I went to the coffee room on my break, uh, the people got up, they were in the break room, and they moved to the other table. Um, I had comments about, I don't want that in to touch my money. But then, when they saw that my line moved faster than others' line, <laughs> guess whose line they got in? <laughs> so after uh, the, just the regular teller windows was your first uh, level in, into the banking industry. So uh, even though they said it was hard, it wasn't difficult. If you got common sense, you can count and do all those things. So in 90 days, I was transferred to the commercial teller side of the building. After that, I learned that there's no upward mobility for me here. You know, I, I don't really like it. Uh, I'm here, so I started looking. Because see, I think I was making $218 a month, and my goal was to make $400 a month. <laughs> 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 so yeah. I started testing. Uh, with the state, and uh, wound up getting another job. Yeah. Okay. Brenda, thank you. You're welcome. Well, over the years, the downtown area received more than $160 million from the city for redevelopment projects. The west side received $22 million. It's an area that lacks basic necessities like grocery stores still. So before we bring up Ms. Kathy Thomas from the city of Las Vegas, Clay T, I just want you to chime in here about a little bit about what you've learned about the West Side over the years. So how, how long do we have? We <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so when I came to UNLV, we didn't have an oral history research center at the time. We didn't have an oral history research center in Southern Nevada. Northern Nevada had a center. So the history department at UNLV thought it was time that Las Vegas had an oral history center. So I was lucky enough to get that job once I had gotten a master's degree at UNLV. I did not know at first where the black community was located. But at that time, I used to get my hair done because I had a um, perm in my hair. So I had to go to the beauty shop every other week. So I went in to the beauty shop one day and I said, 
where is the black community? And my beautician said, the, girl, the woman getting into the chair after you is the woman you should meet. And that woman was Kalani Gay. Kalani Gay was the daughter of Jimmy and Hazel Gay. Mm -hmm. And she said, you have to talk to my parents. I will introduce you. So the first house I went to in the African American community was in Bonanza Village. So when I got to Bonanza Village and they said, this is the black community, I'm good. So, you know, this was the sprawling ranch house. It was just wonderful. And they told me about coming to Las Vegas from a place called Fordyce, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And they told me all about Fordyce. And they told me how they got here and why they came. So that was my first interview in the African American community. And one of them told me that there was a migration as well from Tallulah, Louisiana. My second interview was with Lucille Bryant, from, who worked as a maid for years on the Las Vegas Strip, had loved her life, had been able to buy cars. She had two houses. So she showed me what it could do, what you could do working as a maid, because she was a member of the Culinary Union. So I started learning the history of the African American community from the community. Then, of course, I did what most historians do. I read every newspaper, starting back with the Age newspaper in 1900-something. <laughs> so just learning what had happened in Las Vegas and how African Americans fit into that picture. So yes. There was a mob, we are in the mob museum right now, <laughs> and we know about gaming and all of that, but I began to learn the richness of this city from the people who lived it. So I was able to write a thesis for my master's degree because I had interviewed enough people who taught me what it was to come to Las Vegas by car. You had to know what kind of food to fix, to bring with you for that two and a half, three day journey by car. And both Fordyce and Tallulah had people who would drive you back and forth. It was the most amazing history that I had ever heard in my life. Because when I was home in Ahoskie, North Carolina, I was never old enough to learn that kind of history back there. Yeah, we learned some things, but never to sit down with somebody and interview them like I was able to do here in this city. I've interviewed Dave Washington. I've interviewed Marsha Washington. I've interviewed Laverne right there on, on the screen. And guess whose interview I never was able to finish? Guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to know that the, the over 200 interviews that that I was able to collect in the black community. Now, we do interviews for all communities all over the county. I work with two women who are project managers. So they may each manage a project at a time and I continue to work in the African American community. That's a privilege you have when you're director of a program. Mm -hmm. So because of that, our website is available. You can go to our website and you can read these interviews. So just go to, the easiest way to get to it is just go to Google and type in documenting the African American experience in Las Vegas. And before you finish type, typing that in, the African American website will pop up. And you can read, you can watch, you can look at photographs, there was a photographer named Clinton Wright who took photographs in the community for years. Mm -hmm. He donated a lot of those photographs to the UNLV oral history, to the uh, special collections where the Oral History Research Center is located. Because of that, we have that richness that you can go online and you can look at the photographs that he's taken. You can look at photo photographs of the women who participated 
in the welfare rights movement, the late 60s and early 70s. You can see some of those photographs. You can see photographs of Hattie Canty, who became president of the Culinary Union. Mm -hmm. So you can learn her story and, and listen to the, to, to the interviews, or you can read them. We, we transcribe every one of them before we put them online. So you may listen if you like, but most people don't have time to actually listen. But you have time to read the history. The history is rich. And so that's what my job allows me to do. That's the kind of history that I am allowed, have been allowed to learn here in this city. So it's rich, it's wonderful. Thank you. Shakela, can I interject something, please? Sure. Uh, I'm learning for the first time that your first experience was with uh, Cloney Gay. Yeah. Cloney Gay and I were best friends. Uh, Jimmy Gay and my parents were best friends. They were the migrants from Fordyce, Arkansas. I was born in Fordyce, Arkansas. My mother was a founding member of the Fordyce Club that gave you that wealth of information. She is one, she was the first black woman at the basic magnesium plant to actually make munitions for World War II. And these are things if you Yeah, I don't became know, a member of the Fordyce Club. I actually went to Fordyce. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful. We, we know a lot yes. together, yes. Thank you. Well, let's bring up Miss, Miss Kathy Thomas. Um, from the city of Las Vegas. Thomas is the director of the Office of Community Services for the city, and she is a lead director on the 100 Plan in Action and on the city's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Ms. Thomas, thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us what the 100 Plan in Action is first? I certainly can. Thank you for having me here this evening, and I really have to acknowledge whose shoulders I get to stand on so I want to thank all of the panelists for lifting me up uh, figuratively and literally, like Miss Brenda Williams has pulled me aside and whispered in my ear a time or two and got me straight. So <laughs> I want to thank her for that. And I want to thank all of them for being so generous with their time and their wisdom and their knowledge with me, uh, particularly those of you here on the stage have been pouring into me. I'm a transplant to this area, and uh, you all have poured into me. So I want to just acknowledge that I'm standing on your shoulders tonight. So thank you. So, 100 plan. The 100 plan is an acronym. It's not a 100 year plan. We're not going to take a 100 years <laughs> to have progress. 100 is an acronym for the Historic Urban Neighborhood Design Redevelopment Plan. And it is a plan that was actually generated by the historic West Side residents. Initially, the city had nothing to do with it. The residents came together with some graduate students at UNLV and talked about those things that were most important. So if you look at the original plan, you will see in its first few pages a dis discussion about the big eight moves. Those are the things that the residents decided were important to them, where they wanted to see progress in terms of repairing the edges, where there are a lot of vacant lots, or housing infield, um, certain kind of community engagement, right? Plan got done, got presented to the city council, was approved and adopted, and went on the shelf, like many plans do. Mm -hmm. change on the city council, new council person comes in and says, okay, there's a plan. All you directors come in here and give me an update on where you are with this plan. And so we're looking at our shoelaces and checking our watches and because we hadn't done anything, quite frankly. And the council person, uh, Councilman Cedric Creer, said, this is not acceptable. So you told the community you were going to do this kind of work 
they went through a process and brought it to you and you stuck it on a shelf, that's never going to be acceptable. And so we reconvened and put together an implementation strategy. So this second document that you will see on the city's website as the 100 plan in action, looked at those big eight moves and said, where are the places where we can have traction now? That we can get momentum now? That we can start working now? It's a fairly comprehensive vision, the original 100 plan. And trying to do all of it now would possibly set us up for failure. And we wanted to deliver some meaningful things in manageable chunks. How much human resource, how much cash or capital can we pull together and show some movement on those things that the community has identified as important. And so now we have the 100 plan in action. And you see, those of you who can see the screen, specifically looking at the past, the present, and the future. Really wanting to pay homage to the history of the historic West Side, and that's represented by that shot of the Moulin Rouge. It is a rich history. It is dynamic and viable, and it is bittersweet and a struggle. It is triumphant, and it is hopeful. So wanting to pay homage to that. The picture in the center is the historic West Side School as it has been restored and reactivated so that you have the, um, a number of not-for-profits operating there. You've got the radio station. It is an active, vibrant, living thing in the community, and we wanted to recognize that. And then the third picture is a rendering, a vision of a potential African-American museum on the historic West Side to say, okay, how do we get there? How do we get to the kinds of uh, social and economic investments in the community that the community has identified as important? Let's go to the next slide. So we couldn't do it all at once. We decided to focus on a particular area for our first phase. And I don't know if folks can see that red outline on the map. So it's not the entire historic West Side in phase one. It's a really focused area so that we can work on some catalytic investments that if we step forward, then other aspects, other sectors in the community will step forward. So looking at repurposing the Park, the James Gay Park has been closed for a number of years, and so we want to reactivate that as green space. Uh, looking at um, Jackson Street. Now, I know it says Jackson Ave on the pictures. The community calls it Jackson Street, so I call it Jackson Street. It was like Fremont at one time, right? It yep. was the commercial retail entertainment hub with casinos and restaurants and barber shops and clothing and malt shop and so on. So how do we revitalize that economic vein? Uh, looking at repurposing Ethel Pearson Park, um, there's a large public housing site uh, called Marble Manor. How do we partner with the housing authority to um, rebuild that so that it is a mixed income, um, vibrant part of the community? Next slide. And so we started looking at the original plan and saying, okay, we need a vision for this first phase. And so being very intentional about being rooted in the African-American tradition from the historic West Side, but also saying the whole world is welcome to live, work, and play here. And so embracing the history and being very intentional about that history. And at the same time saying, look, if we're gonna rebuild uh, everyone's welcome to enjoy it. We, we want jobs, we want culture, we want history, we want better housing. And looking at in three main categories, um, connected to the big eight moves from the original plan. So that includes housing. You hear a lot of times, oh, the reason there's no economic vitality is because you don't have enough rooftops over there. Meaning there are not enough residents who are there day to day to support um, retail, and, and we could debate that if we had more time, but let's roll with it. 
Um, and then looking at <laughs> equitable development, that equity is the lens through which every project will be viewed. We don't want to displace the current residents. We want to welcome back residents who have, may have moved to other parts of the county. We want to make it a place where the heirs, uh, the descendants of folks who lived and thrived in the West Side want to come back to the West Side. And lastly, to bolster entrepreneurship, education, and the opportunity for jobs. Next slide, please. And so I talked about those catalytic investments. Um, there, it is no secret that there has been a systemic and systematic disinvestment. And that's true of neighborhoods like this all across America. Um, it's not unique in the sense that um, neighborhoods that have been both uh, legally and de facto segregated end up being redlined by financial institutions literally on a map. We're not going to lend or make capital available in these neighborhoods. Um, it is no secret that there are neighborhoods all over America that are literally on the wrong side of the tracks or the Iron Curtain, as it was referred to here, that there are these um, physical and psychological dividing lines. Mm -hmm. And it was legally segregated. And so there are all kinds of reasons why you see the development patterns that you see. We've uh, worked with developers. We show them a map. And they say, my goodness, there are a lot of churches. Like, we can't build restaurants, and we can't do this and that. And look at all those churches. And th this is how systems work together, right? So you legally segregate a neighborhood and say, the only place that blacks can own land is here. You fast forward a few decades, and you see a black church on every other corner and say, well, we can't invest there because of all those churches. And so that's insult to injury. The injury is the segregation that forced a community into a geographically defined area and said, this is the only place you get to be. And then when the legal barrier is removed, you say, well, we can't invest in that community. Look at that development pattern that was created by legal segregation. So. We know we need, we meaning the city, uh, quite frankly, was historically a part of that set of facts, part of the system that created the challenges here. And so we need to invest now to sort of prime the pump. We need to be the catalyst so that the private sector, the philanthropic sector, comes back to the table and invests in the neighborhood. And so we looked at some specific areas. I mentioned Jackson Street already because it had been the economic and social lifeblood of the community. Uh, we've talked a lot about the Washington Avenue and D Street area where the historic West Side School currently exists. And there at Washington Avenue and H Street where we have a lot of um, housing developments with uh, both public housing, but also adjacent to that is the site of the former Moulin Rouge um, resort. And looking at those as catalytic opportunities that if we invest there, if we work with community partners to spur investment in these areas, then it will spur investment across the community. And you may see a couple of green belts along the freeway. Um, that's James Gay Park and Ethel Pearson Park. And we don't have a lot of vibrant green space in this community, also a part of a historic, uh, systemic, systematic, and systemic. And I use those two words very intentionally. Um, systematic is a level of intention. Mm -hmm. Systemic is a pattern that may or may not be overt and intentional, but they work together in a way where institutions um, have a set of standards and it's systemic that it creates barriers. Whereas um, systematic implies intentionality that humans are making decisions about how they engage with the community. The 100 plan is 
intentional in the sense that it wants to attack the historic patterns and to change the current patterns so that we're dealing both with the systems and the systemic uh, problems that are occurring. And so the 100 plan is a living, breathing document. Um, it should change, it will change as opportunities arise, as uh, demands from the community arise. Uh, we are intentionally staying very focused on our engagement so that folks can say, yeah, that's not a good move, Kathy. What are you doing there? Oh, that's an awesome move, Kathy. Do more of that. So that we continue to receive that feedback and that it is a constant engagement. We want to partner with the community. We don't want to do things for the community. And we certainly want to stop doing things to the community. We want to be a meaningful, engaged, and intentional partner with the community to do the transformative work that um, historically has not happened. My contact information, um, if folks can see it, is there on the screen. Uh, we are serious about, we want to hear from everybody, and we um, have broadly defined stakeholders in this plan as if you live here, work here, play here, or pray here, you are a stakeholder, and we want you to be engaged mm -hmm. in revitalizing this community. Kathy, thank you so much for further explaining what the city is doing um, on the west side. You are very much appreciated, so thank you. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. We do have a few minutes for any questions and we can open the stage up for anyone in the audience and those online. Jeff will be assisting us um, to ask any questions and you can head right over to this mic over here if you have any questions for our panelists tonight. As a panelist, can I ask Ms. Kathy a question? Ms. Qu <laughs> Ms. Kathy, can you address the, uh, our new signs that we have welcoming people into the west side. Thank you, Ms. Brenda, absolutely. So this is a place-based strategy. The, the, the 100 plan is a place-based strategy. And one of the tenets is that um, you literally stake a claim. The community gets to stake a claim and say, this is who we are, this is where we are. You're on our turf now. You're welcome, come on. But this, this is our turf. And so there are several signs now, actually designed by a local African-American artist. And we utilize community development block grant funds, which are specific dollars, federal dollars set aside for neighborhood revitalization. To put signs at strategic places, it is um, uh, community identity, it is a welcoming tool, it's a wayfinding tool, and so the signs are strategically placed to um, welcome both residents and visitors into the community. Um, they are there to um, undergird the existing community pride that is uh, such a core tenet of our work is to recognize and up uplift the neighborhood pride because um, that's one of the key things we always hear as we engage with the community. Mm -hmm. And so these signs um, really are the, the markers, the indicators, the um, banners, if you will, that the community wanted to lift up its pride about this place. And so those signs just got installed over the last couple of months. They light up at night, and <clears throat> they're really... Um, uh, a beautiful kind of classic design that um, references the past but welcomes people to the future. Thank you. That was the beacon we spoke about, mm -hmm. a beacon to the west side, yes. Yeah. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to ask any questions for our panelists? You can just head right over here, thank you. Okay, here. 
is, is 900 West Bonanza Road the physical address of uh, the Moulin Rouge Hotel and Casino? 900 West Bonanza. If you know. You know that? Do you want to know, do you verify the address? The address of the lot for the former Moulin Rouge Hotel and Casino. Is it 900 West Bonanza Road? Yes, it is. It is? Yes. There's a, there's a brewery across the street that's relatively new. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? The, the brewery's not across how, much, how much time have we got left? <laughs> we have about five minutes. Well, let me say this since nobody have any questions. Not only was I in the fire service, but I've also been a businessman. Before your time, Ms. Kathy, our business, New Ventures Capital Development Corporation, met with Mayor Oscar Goodman about New Market's tax credit dollars before the city or anybody in this valley knew anything about it. We didn't get a dang. We were in business since 1984. Bob, William H. Bob Bailey was one of our board members. Ernest Fountain was the president, CEO. I was chairman of the board, Horatio Lopez. So in fact, in, in 2017, we just threw up our hands because we even tried to work with the city. Going forward, we, we decided, because this was, was a for-profit business with a multi-million dollar portfolio. But as, as the economy went bad, uh, the packages started getting bought out. So again, in 17, we just, because we got tired of the racism at SBA, we got tired of them too. So we, we're back now with a non-profit business, specifically set up to do loan packaging for, for businesses, particularly in West Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. We can't get no help. We've been turned down by the region up out of, out of Seattle says, y'all don't have enough experience. We've been in business since 1984. So the racism that goes on in America still exists. And, and it's really sad because our goal again is to, to do things that's gonna help to grow a community. We met with Mayor Carolyn Goodman probably before, before we decided to throw up our hands. And see, when you, when you put in for a new market's tax credit dollars, you can't change the package once it's gone in. Because we met with Carolyn, Mayor Goodman, and we said, look, could you write in 500 to a million for us to, to do a, a revolving loan fund for particularly suffering, not, on, not only blacks, but blacks in particular, but others have, we funded many, many different businesses throughout this valley. And I won't call his name because he ain't here to defend himself. <laughs> but he told the mayor, well, we can't change it in the middle of the stream. Well, she said, well, next time we go for funding, can we put new ventures in? Well, guess what? They went for more funding. They didn't even give us a call. Mm -hmm. You know who I'm talking about, but because he ain't here, I won't call his damn name, but he ain't worked two dead flies. <laughs> but but my, only, my only point is, y'all, all the racist activities that exist within this community and with, within there. this country, within this world, it needs to stop. Because there, there's so much money, y'all, there's enough for all of us to get along and do well. We don't have to do this to each other as, as fellow human beings. There's enough for all of us. I'll get off my soapbox. But thank you again for the opportunity to be here. So oh, sure. may I make my closing remarks now? <laughs> OK. Thank you, Dave, for those closing remarks, mm -hmm. because I will just continue. Um, <laughs> I, I am very, very happy to be on the panel. So for the last couple of months, we've been doing uh, panel discussions on systemic racism. Systemic racism we find in business, we find in healthcare, education, housing, the criminal justice system, you name the system in America, and systemic racism is the under, undergirding foundation of the system. So at one time, people would say, we need to start again. We need to tear down the system. I didn't know what they were talking about. I do now. It is in every system in American society. And that's why we're having the hard conversations now because we have to end systemic racism. It has to end, and it can end, and it's going to end. And we, you should know and be prepared because reparations and reconciliations will come out of this.
Clay T, thank you. I want to give Brenda, do you have a closing remark as well? Actually, um, my remarks would be that I'm extremely happy to be here. I'm gratified that my community has seen fit to allow me to do the things that I have been able to do uh, to affect change in my community. And that's what it's all about, It's doing the right thing. When you have power, you must recognize that power and use it to the advantage of your people. And with that, I'm grateful. Thank you. Brenda, thank you. And Laverne, I want to get you in here as well. Do you have a closing <laughs> remark or anything that you would like to say to, to the audience? Yes, I would just like to um, recognize Marcia, Dr. Marcia Robinson at the West Las Vegas Arts yes. Center mm -hmm. and the tremendous work that she has done um, which started out at Simba. She was one of, of my teachers at Simba Town Development Center. And uh, we also danced together at MGM. And I have seen the center develop many uh, talented artists and students because of her ongoing efforts. And uh, it, the West Las Vegas Arts Center is not operating to full capacity now, of course, because of the pandemic, but I hope to see it open its doors and just boom the way it was. Yes. Laverne, thank you. Thank you to everyone who was able to watch this program online and those joining in the audience. We really, really appreciate it. And a special thank you to our panelists, Laverne Ligon, Brenda Williams, Clay T. White, and David Washington. As Kathy Thomas so beautifully said, it is an honor to stand on each of your shoulders. We are inspired by you daily. You are appreciated and loved. So thank you. And thank you all for thank being you. here tonight.